Welcome to the Widely Optimized Wellness Podcast. I am your host, Terea Rodriguez, and I'm joined by the lovely co-host, Evie Tackett. Both of us are functional diagnostic nutrition practitioners, and we love working with women from all over the world through our virtual programs, helping women not only feel better, but actually achieve that vibrant, no holds barred version of themselves they've been missing for a long time. And how we actually get there? Well, that is what this show is all about. Now, please keep in mind that this podcast is created for educational purposes only and should never be used as a replacement for medical diagnosis or treatment. And if you like what you hear today, we would love for you to hit that follow button, leave a review in Apple podcast, share with your friends and keep coming back for more. Let's start today's adventure, shall we? Okay, cool. So today we're going to talk about a topic that is a follow-up to a topic that we talked about in season two, which is sun exposure. Abby and I both are proponents of getting some sun exposure, especially at certain times of the day. Yes, we are. And we also know that we didn't talk about the negative side effects or the downsides of getting too much sun exposure. So today we're going to devote this episode to the downsides of sun exposure, which can lead to skin cancers. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, you know, I got some feedback from that episode of like, well, you know, you know, how much is too much or, you know, you didn't really mention the potential side, the potential side effects, or I have friends that are in, you know, that are estheticians and they're very particular about that. And they almost, they're almost, they are afraid of the sun. And I think that, you know, a lot of my friends who see estheticians regularly, they're afraid of the sun. And I understand that there are definitely things to be on the lookout for as there's going to be with everything in life. Um, But we didn't want to, we didn't want to seem ignorant to that fact of like, there are these very real things such as skin cancer that can also come as well. So I think it'll be good for us to talk on, talk about that and touch on that and really some firsthand experience, you know, yeah, kind definitely of current events of what's experience. going on with you. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I'll give a little bit of a recent history. So um, for those of you not watching the video, If you were to look at a picture of me or see a picture of me, you can tell that I've got fair skin and blonde hair and, you know, I I have Norwegian and Dutch descent and so definitely Scandinavian genetics. And so I've always been susceptible to early sunburns. So my limits last time when we talked about sun exposure and talking about what's an appropriate amount of time in the sun, I know that I can't really go unprotected more than about 30 minutes and then I'm going to burn and I'm going to regret it because when it burns, it definitely, I get the like stingy burns. Um, so I don't enjoy that experience at all. Um, and some people can go longer than that, but what we know about overexposure to the sun, right, is that it can damage the skin cells and then the skin cells can turn into cancerous skin cells. And that can lead towards various different types and classifications of skin cancer. And whether it happens with one burn, I don't think it happens with one burn, but it can happen over the course of repeated burns and repeated damage to the skin cells from sun exposure and non-protected sun exposure. That's really what we're talking about is non-protected sun exposure. Otherwise, if you were protected, you'd be wearing a sunscreen or some protective clothing or a hat or staying in the shade. Like those are all various forms of sun protection. But most recently this year, I noticed some changes to my skin and lo and behold, it turned out to be basal cell carcinoma skin cancer, which is a very common form of skin cancer. So I've been learning a lot about skin cancer in the recent months and uh, learning a little bit more about how difficult it is to self-identify skin cancers over the last couple months. Yeah. So was this just a routine checkup or because it sounds like you didn't, you didn't have any troubling spots or troubling areas of like, oh, I should probably get this checked out. How did, how did that even come about for you? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I have, uh, I have natural spots on my skin. And so those spots are a genetic um, 
condition called porokeratosis. And so there are certain places on my arms and my legs that I have these pink spots that are totally benign. There's nothing really that dermatologists know can effectively treat porokeratosis, but it just creates these pink spots on the skin. And I've had them for, I don't know, decades. Like it's just been something that's been part of my life. And so what's interesting though, to me is that these spots on my skin are pink. So I have fair skin tone. And so they're pinkish in color and they stand out because they're pink. And I've had those for a very long time. What I noticed, however, is that on my arm, I noticed what I thought was a mole show up on my arm. And I was like, interesting. I think I have a mole there. And then yeah. as time passed, and of course, most of this noticing happened during the pandemic. So that kind of lengthened the time for me to actually seek attention for it. But um, what I noticed about this mole is that within a few months, that mole got angry. So that's me with finger quotes with angry, meaning it, it got red, it got scaly and would flake off. And then sometimes it would bleed and the bleeding would be difficult to stop. Like it's one okay. of those like real sensitive spots. So I was like, huh, angry moles. I've heard about angry moles and usually the dermatologist doesn't like angry moles. And so that's what caused me to go see a dermatologist. Yeah. And when she saw it, that was an immediate, like, that's coming off right now. We know that's basal cell carcinoma, and we're going to go ahead and biopsy that site. Um, what unbeknownst to me when we did a full skin check um, after that appointment is there were a lot of other spots on my chest and my shoulders that were also basal cell, but they were pink spots. And so I oh, mis so they mistaken them. They, yeah. they to me... Because I untrained eye, right? To me, they looked like these porokeratosis spots. So I was like, oh, there's other pink spots. Um, and so the education that I got from my dermatologist is that the porokeratosis has kind of a border, a raised border around it, whereas these pink spots did not. And um, it wasn't a, a uniform circular shape like these other porokeratosis spots. And so she helped me identify that basal cell carcinoma can look very different. So none of these spots look like angry moles, right? They were just pink spots on my skin. Um, and they can look different from person to person, which I thought was really interesting about basal cell. Yeah. And what, well, one, how did you feel? with that news, right? I'm sure that's yeah. not easy to hear. And like, what was that process for you of thinking you were just going to go get this one thing removed or get this one thing looked at? And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, what, what do, what do wait, I Wait, there's now? more. Like, yeah. 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 That's a great question. So, um, I think, you know, the first, the, the mold looking one, right. She was like, oh yeah, no problem. We're just going to take that off. Um, I, I had geared myself up because the treatment plan on that one, we did the biopsy and then it was determined that they needed to take more tissue out of the arm. So we had to do what's called an excision surgery on the arm and cut out the tissue basically until you got clear margins. And so I had geared myself up for like, okay, I can handle this and we're going to have a scar and it's going to be some healing time and that's cool. But then, you know, I'm done with my cancer story. And then when I had that full skin check and we found seven other spots, I was kind of like, whoa, wait a minute. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot of spots yeah. in my mind. And from a dermatologist perspective, that's not a lot of spots really. Like they've seen worse. They've seen basal cell carcinoma all over people's skin or really deeply embedded into people's skin. And so these were very superficial spots and most of them could be taken care of through liquid nitrogen. So they just froze those spots off um, with the exception of two of those spots. Two of those spots had to have a different kind of treatment, but um, I think it was really interesting mental exercise for me to go through to understand that, oh, this isn't necessarily a one and done kind of thing. This is going to be something that I'm going to have to think about from now until the future is just really making sure that I'm conscious and aware of how much 
sun protection I am using, but also knowing that I am fair skinned and I am light toned, that this could be something that comes back. And so I think it took a little while for me to shift the diagnosis from, oh my God, I'm going to die to <laughs> actually, this is manageable. It's very common. And for most, the most part, and I'm not going to say all parts because I have read up on basal cell carcinoma and it can be dangerous. But for the most part, if it's caught early, then it's a non-issue. It just takes a little bit of freezing or a little bit of topical treatment, um, which is great. Great news if you can find it, it early. But that's yeah. Like, that's, yeah. And that's what you've been doing is a topical treatment primarily, right? Are you Are you finished with that or? Yes. So okay. on those two spots that remained, um, yeah. we had to do a topical treatment that was a, it's a form of um, chemotherapy, but it, it's not a cell destroying chemotherapy. It's a, a immunogenic one. So basically what it was doing is it was um, allow, stirring up the immune system at that site to have the immune system come in and attack those cells and, and destroy those cells and get rid of them. That process is, uh, it causes a lot of like irritation and redness, as you can imagine, like when the immune system is coming in to like heal something, if you think about a cut on your finger, that cut doesn't just, you know, go back to normal skin right away. First, it has to like swell up and get red and inflamed and all of those things. And it, you know, yeah. it's sore. Same kind of thing happened at the, that site where I was doing the topical cream. But then eventually what ends up happening is that those cells start to flake off and, and go away and it's replaced with new cells. And so that process took five to six weeks of doing that. Um, and it got very intense at the end. Like it was definitely an intense, like very sensitive to the touch kind of spot. Um, okay. But it seems to be healing very nicely. And I still have to go in for the follow up. But yeah, that was one of the treatments that I ended up doing. Yeah. And how often, well, I guess now that you've been through this, you're going to be diligent with checking in and having this, right? Like getting scanned and having the doctor look, but um, yeah. is there anything like, are there more frequent check-ins up until a certain point where you're like, okay, we cleared this, we got this. Now I can go back to doing like a yearly check-in with you. So <clears throat> when I first talked to the dermatologist about this and it was just the one spot, she said that I would be on six month checks for life. And a lot of this had to do with family history. So there's history in my family of having basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. So the, the latter two being the more serious skin cancer types. Um, and so because of that, she just felt six month checks were in order. I would agree with her, especially since I couldn't recognize what I thought was just yeah. a benign pink spot, right? I couldn't recognize it. Now that I've had more spots um, for the next year, I'm on three month checks just to make sure that it doesn't come back. Once we get through that year, then probably six month checks from that point forward. Okay. And what are some of the, like, what do you have to do differently now? Cause I, I, I mean, I know that you're not hiding from the sun. Like you were just paddle boarding this weekend. Like you're being, like you're right. outside, you're trying to get the benefits that we discussed in that other episode. But what are some of the things that you're doing differently now because of this experience? I would say that what's changed for me is just being a lot more intentional about sun protection um, in the sense of getting a broader brimmed hat. So before yeah. I would get maybe like a baseball cap, right? Or a trucker hat or whatever, and just shade my face. But now I recognize like if I do that, then the ears are exposed, the back of the neck is exposed. So a broader brimmed hat, thank God they're in fashion right now. So that's yeah. awesome. Um, yes. So wearing a hat, um, getting used to longer sleeve UV protection clothing, I definitely am a tank top kind of girl, like sleeves. I call them arm prisons. I don't really like sleeves. I've never liked sleeves, even in the winter. Um, so, you know, getting used to that kind of protection, but making sure that my unprotected sun exposure time 
is at earlier times of the day with less of a UV index. And I think that is really the piece that has changed the most. I used to say, okay, well, I haven't had any sun exposure today. It's noon. I'm going to go eat my lunch outside. But what's happening is that UV index is so strong at noon that I'm getting much more intense radiation, UV radiation from the sun versus when I'm doing it in the morning, then it's less intense and I'm still getting those benefits. So I think I'm just changing a little bit of my sun protection regime in terms of clothing. And then also just time of day has changed a little bit. Yeah. And that's one that's definitely important for most people to know anyways of like, you know, the, the closer to solar noon that you are outside, the higher the rays are going to be. And so the UVB rays are going to be. And so it is better if you're going to be more unprotected to be doing it earlier or later in the day when like that, you know, solar noon has finished. Um, And I think that like, there's, again, we talked about it in the episode in the sun, sun exposure episode of, it's really important. There's so many benefits to it, but again, there's always going to be that other side. And so it's helpful to hear and be reminded because especially for people like me, I tend to, you know, I, I could be better about my sun exposure in terms of not going so long for with not going for so long without sunscreen. So for me, this mm-hmm. is good. And it's like, I'm not really in a good habit of getting checked. Um, but I also do have darker skin than you as well. So I think I've just kind right. of used that. Um, but it's important to remember because, you know, I have spots on my skin that I'm like, I'm not quite sure what you are. Are you like an acne scar? Are you something else? You know? So I, you know, it's something that is important and it's a good reminder for me to hear about too. Yeah. I think, you know, keeping in mind that there's a bit of a, uh, age difference between us. So, you know, I just turned 51 this year. So, being older means that I'm going to see this more because I've had more exposure to the sun than you have, you know? And so if I were to look back and say, okay, 25 year old self, what would, what advice would I give myself? I think I would give myself an advice of like, go get a baseline from a dermatologist, like just understand what the baseline is because the, sooner you can catch this stuff early, you don't have to do an excision surgery on your arm, right? And get scarred and all of that stuff. So the sooner that you can catch it, the easier it is. And then you'll know what your skin tends to um, present when you have cells that have turned cancerous. Because my family members that have had it that I talked to during this process, their spots looked completely different right? Some of them looked like an open sore that wouldn't heal. And some of them looked like old scar tissue. And then for people of color, like it doesn't have to be a pink spot. It can be a a brown spot or a darker brown spot, right? So um, not to be confused with H spots, right? This is where (laughs) we want to use a dermatologist who's an expert that can actually, that is trained in understanding, well, what's the difference between a freckle And an age spot, or what's the difference between a freckle and a basal cell carcinoma? For some people, they look very the same, but for for a dermatologist who has a trained eye, they can really look at certain things and know right away of like, okay, we need to take a look at that, or let's use liquid nitrogen and induce the skin to grow new cells and see if it'll take care of it on its own. There's lots of different ways to manage it, but I would think. I would say that if I were to do anything over again, it would be using the um, expertise of a dermatologist a little bit sooner so that I didn't have to wait for angry mole to show up. Yeah. I like the idea of the baseline of getting like, this is what it should look like, or this is where you're starting. And then now you can see where things change because again, the older that you're getting or I'm getting, it's like, well, how long has that been there? Or yeah, you know, it's like, well... I just, I think I've had this my whole life or wait, is that, is that new? So it's good to have an idea of, you know, where are you starting before you really get a lot of that sun? And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really happy that you've taken this situation, which is not ideal. And, you know, I'm sure brought up a lot of emotions, but you've taken it of like, okay, what's the feedback I'm getting? How can I make changes to myself? How can I use this to help Mm -hmm. other people? And because it could have been something more of like, I'm just going to feel really sorry for myself and I'm going to be really upset. And not to say that you wouldn't be entitled to that because you would, 
but you've turned it around of like, okay, this is good feedback. And now I have a chance to do things better and you are doing things better. Thank you. I really appreciate you uh, mentioning that because I think for some people, you know, getting a diagnosis of cancer is never easy. And I'm not going to say it's easy peasy to get even skin cancer diagnosis. It wasn't easy. Um, it definitely caused me to question past actions, you know, question yeah. like, oh gosh, should I really be covering up all the time and being afraid of the sun? It, And when we recorded that sun exposure episode, you know, it, it I was going through this simultaneously at that time, you know, and it was interesting because I've had to do a lot of reevaluation of like, how do I want to have a relationship with the sun and the outdoors? And am I going to let this stop me? And ultimately what I decided is that, no, I'm not going to let it stop me, but yes, I am going to have to make some changes because even if the skin is a hundred percent clear now, like it is, doesn't necessarily mean that I've got the free and clear to just like run around in the sun unprotected all the time because of course all those skin cells have already had exposure to the skin already, right? So it's that repeated UV exposure that can be damaging. So I do have to make some changes. I have to be a little bit realistic about it. And um, so it's, I think for the most part, it's caused me to have even more of a balanced approach with the sun, as opposed to just picking one side. And, you know, I don't want to be on one side. I don't want to be afraid of the skin. I want to still be able to go out and enjoy paddle boarding. But I also know that an activity like that means that I need to use sunscreen and wear a hat and, you know, longer sleeve clothing to be able to stay out there longer. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that's good reminders for all of us, especially like I'm even I'd be curious, actually, could you link some of the clothing that you do wear, like for sun protection sure. in the show notes for someone who's like, oh, I'd like to look into that and I don't even know where to begin. I think that'll yeah. be a helpful resource. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it's nice to know that there are clothing manufacturers that do create clothing that are UV protective and keep you cool. That was the big thing that I was just like, I don't want to melt in the heat with all this long sleeve clothing on, um, you know, and, but there are fabrics that are breathable that you can still be in the sun and it helps you be in the sun. Um, but yes, I'll definitely link that. I'll also link um, some basic uh, education on basal cell carcinoma because it's so common that people can peruse some of the pictures. Like, I don't want to get all gross on people, but at the same yeah. time, like, I think it's good for people to recognize that certain spots don't necessarily look like what we think skin cancer looks like. You know, I remember my mom had um, squamous skin cancer, squamous cell skin cancer when I was really, really little. So, you know, I have very vague memories, but I remember what those spots looked like on her arms and my spots never looked like that. Right. So I was just like, oh, well, that it can't be cancer. It's just a mold that's angry. And sure enough, you know, dermatologist yeah. was like, out, <laughs> that's coming yeah. off now. <laughs> so yeah, everybody can be different. So I think just letting people see what that looks like will help have awareness and help you recognize, gosh, maybe that spot, maybe I should have it looked at. Yeah. I think that's important. And now, you know, we are recording this in the middle of the summer. So I'm assuming more people are in the sun more often and more frequently. I know that I am. And so it's important to keep an eye on that. And again, just reevaluate my actions of like, maybe I shouldn't wait so long to put sunscreen on, or maybe I should take a little bit of a break and go sit under the umbrella at the pool or Maybe my hat mm -hmm. isn't big enough or, you know, whatever it might be. So, yeah, definitely have invested in a large brimmed hat. That's, it's been great to have it too, because I can feel the difference. Like it shades all the way to the shoulders. Um, yeah. And so I can really feel the difference in just the heat on my skin. So I know that I'm protecting it at least somewhat, but 
you know, water sports, of course, add to the complexity because now you've got the reflection coming from underneath. So even if you are wearing a hat, you have to be careful about that. But um, I think that the biggest takeaway here is that if you're dealing with something that you're catching early, it's really, 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 really treatable and it isn't a death sentence. Um, I will say, I think from coming from a natural approach to how I approach wellness, having to do the excision surgery was less of an issue because that was just like a physical thing. Having to do the topical chemotherapy, that was a complete like, I had to come to terms with that because that felt very much like using some kind of effort. I didn't understand it really. Number one, I didn't understand what that topical cream was doing. And I was making an assumption that I was going to be putting toxic stuff into the body because we think about chemotherapy with other types of cancer, like breast cancer and testicular cancer and that kind of thing as being a very toxic um, exposure and making people very sick during their chemo treatment. And that is very true. The type of topical uh, chemotherapy that's used for basal cell carcinoma works in a completely different way. And so once I understood how it worked and that it was activating my own immune system, that made me feel a little bit better, but I definitely had some mindset work to do to get comfortable with the idea of using a Western medical treatment because let's face it, like Western medicine has let me down so many times in the past that I've kind of like shunted it. And in a different call earlier today, you and I were both talking about that balance between Western medicine and more natural methods. Like sometimes we need to utilize the brilliance of Western medicine in areas that they're really, really good at in addition to all these other natural methods. So it took me a little while to find that balance, but I finally came around to it and here we are. It's all gone. Yeah. So I'm I can, happy about that. I, yeah. I can definitely see a difference in you from, I remember when you first got the diagnosis, cause you told me, and I knew that you were so upset and it was, it was a lot for you and understandably so. And then seeing you progress through, it was like each time we talked, like you just stopped bringing it up. And I, to me, that was like you, well, maybe you just didn't want to talk about it, but I felt like you, that was just part of the healing process for you too, of like, yeah, this is fine. I am doing fine. This is going away. I'm doing the right thing. And it wasn't like so consuming for you. Uh, At least that was my interpretation. Maybe there was another reason why you weren't bringing it up. But to me, that felt like you were really growing and like just embracing that this is what I have to do. This is going to get me better and I'm ready to move on. And so it's been good to see that with you as well of like, you know, and then again, that you haven't been hiding from the sun. You're still going out and you're still doing your outdoor stuff because that's, that's, that's who you are. And so I'm glad yeah. that it hasn't taken that part of you away either. I, I couldn't let it <laughs> number yeah. one, like that's such a core piece of my being. And I, I thrive so much when I am outdoors that I couldn't let it. I had to find that happy medium of, okay, where can I add a little bit more balance to this um, so that I could approach it? But I think it's interesting what you picked up on is the me not talking about it so much. And for me, the internal mental process that I went through from a mindset perspective is that if I was going to make a decision to take advantage of Western medicine and use the prescribed you know, treatment protocol, I had to get to a place where I had faith in that treatment because we all know the placebo effect can be really strong. And if I had no faith that that was going to work and I was going to go through the motions for six weeks, guess what probably would have happened on the other side? I probably wouldn't have healed it as well as if I had faith in that, oh, this medication is helping my immune system do its job better and my body has that ability to heal, then I could put all of my trust into that process. And then it just became a, yeah, this is what I do. This is like taking my supplements in the morning, or this is like feeding myself nourishing food. It's just one of these things that I do. And that's when it became less of a focus topic for me to really talk about because I had already made the decision and this is how we're going to do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's huge. 
and I, I just appreciate you being willing to open up and share about this on the podcast and share about your experience with it. Cause I think it'll be helpful for, I know it'll be helpful for other people. And again, even yeah. just bringing in the awareness is important. So is there anything else that you wanted to mention regarding this, like something that you've learned or something important for people to consider? I think really it's just knowing that there is a balanced approach. And I know that we had recorded an episode that was all for sun exposure and yes, there are downsides. And yes, some, some of us will get diagnosed with basal cell carcinoma. Like that's how common it is. And when it does happen, it doesn't have to be scary. Like that's probably the biggest takeaway is that if you can educate yourself now by, you know, looking at photos or just getting yourself a little bit more acquainted with what it looks like and or find a dermatologist so that you can get a baseline, that's going to help so much more in people's ability to prevent this kind of thing from happening. Then they don't have to go through double types of uh, treatment, actually three different types of treatment like I did. So really it's just, I wanted to share about what was happening and be completely transparent with people that, yeah, there's going to be both sides and we're going to see the positive side to sun exposure and we're going to see the downside to sun exposure, but it doesn't mean that we have to swing to one side of the pendulum and be completely freaked out by the sun and never go out in the sun that has obvious downsides. Right. And it also doesn't mean that we get to, you know, skip around in the sun and da da da, you know, look at me. I don't need to use sun protection. It'll bite you in the ass. Like that's just how it's going to happen. So um, I guess really just the takeaway is empowerment, like empower yourself and don't be afraid of it. It's yeah, all figure outable. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All figure outable and there's a good balance and hopefully we've, you know, drilled that in enough of like sun exposure is really good and healthy for a lot of things, but just be very careful and be mindful about what the amount is for you. So that's right. That's right. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, well thanks, I appreciate everybody. sharing that. Thanks, Abby. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you for sharing and um, hopefully this is helpful for other people too. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of the Wildly Optimized Wellness Podcast. If you are ready to dig deeper into your health, stop playing the wackest symptom game, start testing to get better guidance, you can find more about Terea at tereyarodriguez.com and you can find Evie at holisticallyrestored.com. Want to peek into what it's like to work with us? Come join us at our Optimized Wellness community. You can find the invitation link in the show notes below. And if you have a question for the show, you can submit your question under the podcast section of TereaRodriguez.com. Finally, if you found something helpful in this episode, don't forget to leave a review, hit that follow button, or share it with a friend. They're going to love that you thought of them. Until next time, see you outside.